Or if you want, I don't know, we have, we have an excellent reception later on, so I can schedule a tea break because we've never get back in. But if anyone wants a little water here, we need to stretch our feet abroad. Please feel free to do it. And by the time we get to the college fence and head back, we'll be we having wine as well. Because we don't want to keep going to them. We do our best, but we can. So now it is my great pleasure to um, introduce you to my pastoral pastoral from um, the School of History. And now we've changed colleges. Now we're in the College of Arts, Catholic Studies and Social Sciences. Um, so my thesis originally was on web tools, use in group work among history students. And what he's going to talk to us about is more contemporary work. Uh, so I come uh, it's a very interesting course. Also, so it's fantastic. There's different kinds of work in different departments. Brilliant. Right, so um, I, I am officially based in the School of History, but most of my teaching now is in the Digital Humanities program. Um, my original research question and the original abstract um, was, it was from a second year undergraduate course, uh, War, State and Society, which was a survey course on the history of warfare. Um, and I was interested in two things, game design and group-based work. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about the game design. In the course, the assessment was that the students were required in groups to design a game. Um, and the reason that it was group-based, which is what I was most interested in, was that I was asking them to do something different as an assessment. So I made them do it in groups rather than as individuals on the grounds that um, in a group, if somebody had a problem with some, some conceptual problem with some part of the work, there was a greater likelihood that somebody else in the group would, would help them all across that conceptual difficulty. Um, whereas asking them to do something very different as individuals um, would have had an extra degree of challenge. I felt there'd be a, a safety blanket, a bit of security for them, in that they were doing something different, but they had the, the support of a group to do it. Um, and I, I made them use online collaboration tools to do the group work, and that largely meant using our Blackboard Learning Management System so what I was interested in was how the use of the online discussion tools supported their collaboration in group work. Um, and again, there, there was two agendas in there. Making them use the online discussion tools meant that they documented their activities as a group. Uh, so they didn't all have to meet at particular points in time. They could share ideas on the group discussion forums and there would be a record of it uh, and they could gather it together at the end and, and put it in the final product. It also meant that I could see what the groups were doing. So if a group was not performing, if there were no posts turning up in that group's discussion forum, I could very quickly see there was a problem with that group, and I could intervene and find out what it was, um, and um, take some action to keep the group from, from falling by the wayside. And, and when I started this, um, the problem, one of the issues was, and it's even more important now, that whereas in university we tend to set individual assessments, in the real world, everybody works in groups. Even if you're working in McDonald's, you're part of a team. Um, and you have to work with other people. <clears throat> and for people working with knowledge, um, you have to be able to use collaborative tools, not just to work with people in the same room, but with people all over the world if you're working in a multinational company. So I was conscious that my students needed to be able to use online collaboration tools effectively. They needed those skills. Um, so I, I was kind of forcing them into doing things that would actually be marketable skills um, once they got out. Um, and the other thing in the abstract, you can fit a lot into an abstract, um, the last sentence talks about research methods. Um, and, and I use the traditional Likert scale surveys to assess their feelings and, and their reactions to the process. Um, I also did content analysis of student postings. I looked at what they posted. Um, and I did some coding and tagging of that. And, and then at the end of the day, having used those methodologies, I, I started to become aware of a problem that I felt they were not letting me see what was happening inside the minds of the students and what knowledge creation was going on. So I fell back on traditional good old fashioned historical methods of reading the documents to try and get inside what, what was happening. And that has become a theme through my, my work on online collaboration, even right up to the present day, I'm still thinking about how I can and work on that, and I'll explain some of that later on. Uh, but the idea of using multiple methods, the concept of triangulation, um, is very important in, in any sort of um, 
research in the scholarship of teaching and learning um, to corroborate and to find different, um, more sophisticated ways of, of looking at, at finding sort of different angles on the thing and of verifying uh, the findings. So I, I, the Likert scale survey type questions um, produced the normal sort of results on a scale, a five point scale of how well they felt they, this is one of the, the outputs, how well they felt their group collaborated using different tools. So using the Blackboard Learning Management System, using email, using telephone, face to face meetings, using other um, electronic tools as a substitute for face to face meetings. Um, and there was a number of problems with this. For many of the students, this was their first experience of collaboration using online tools. They were history students. Their normal assessment was you wrote an essay and you wrote the essay the night before it was due in a panic. Um, so the idea that you spent the whole of the course building something up was new and the idea that you did it in groups um, for students in the humanities was new to them. Um, so to a certain extent, as I looked at the, the outputs of this, and, and I did this over two different cohorts, um, I had a go at it first, and I wasn't particularly happy with the way the research was turning out, so I, I let it rest for a couple of years and then came back and had another go at it. Um, but I, I did feel that they had very little prior basis when I was you know, sort of unrolling a new pedagogy on them. Their basis for comparison with previous experience of group work was very limited. So um, I had this niggling feeling in the back of my mind that the very positive results, that they were all very happy with using digital tools for collaboration. But if you start from a basis of zero, then anything is an improvement. So these statistics look okay, but I was dissatisfied with it. Um, I found much more useful when I looked at the different groups. The assignment was that they designed a, a war game based on a particular battle, and I gave them a list of battles roughly from the earliest gunpowder battles up to about Waterloo. Um, and, and so I went through and coded the posts in terms of what the main purpose of the different posts by the different groups were. So you had a sort of tempo and a rhythm to the discussion in the groups. There was a certain amount of the first post I always asked them to introduce themselves so that you had posts where people joined the group. Um, and then there was a certain amount of time devoted to arranging meetings and reporting on meetings and sharing research that they'd found um, and playing some games. Um, and this categorization emerged um, over time from, from reading the posts. Uh, and I got a feel for how, and I was looking to see did, did different groups, um, you know, how, how did they progress through the phases of doing some research on the particular case they were working on, on the particular battle, um, sharing ideas, developing it into concepts, applying it to a design, was there a rhythm or a pattern to that? Um, and to a certain extent there was, in some cases, I mean one of the things I remember from one of the years was it became immediately apparent when one of the groups was stuck on the, the first column and the first two columns here where all their posts were about getting the group together and arranging meetings but they weren't producing any posts where they were finding research about the battle and sharing it. Uh, and they certainly weren't producing any posts where they were starting to devise rules for the war game. Um, so, so that kind of was, gave me a flag on what was going on and, and an awareness uh, of how you should monitor this sort of stuff and pick up the groups that weren't working. Um, and then there's a, sub, there's a column there about things where I simply, my own interventions, uh, the lecturer okay, which is very important in an online forum where you just sort of tap a group and say, yes, that's fine. You post a response. It doesn't mean very much, um, but you're just signifying you've read the post. Because in a face-to-face -face discussion, you can see who's participating, and the students know if you're watching, and they know if you're listening to them. But online, they don't know that. So you do have to reach out and sometimes just make an almost you know, meaningless post just to say, that's OK. Yes, I've seen that. You're doing fine. To give them the reassurance and, and substitute online for the normal, even visual cues that you have um, in a face-to-face -face discussion. There was a certain number of posts where they would actually ask a specific question. Uh, they would put something out there in the discussion forum um, where they raised an issue and it was something that I would have to come in and, and make an intervention and give them an answer or provide them with additional guidance. But in most cases, in the more successful groups, there were less of those. Um, and then there would be some questions about the mechanics of how they would create the graphics. Um, they would have discussion amongst themselves about the mechanics of the thing. And there was always a certain amount of general chat. 
um, amongst the various groups. Um, and the more successful ones, the ones that bonded better, had more of the sort of idle conversational chatter posts than the ones that were just more focused and didn't really have any group feeling building up. Um, but as we'll go on, we'll see that there was a sort of still not quite happy with all of these. At the end, um, some of the, the Likert style surveys asking them about their, um, how the experience had changed their ability to work in a team, to use web-based tools in place of face-to-face. -to -face. All of those graphs very nicely point towards a transformation um, in that the results afterwards, at the end of the course, they all reported being significantly happier with working in a team. They all reported being significantly more confident about using online tools in place of face-to-face -face meeting. Not quite as dramatic a shift on their ability to manage their own learning, but, but still a, a shift. Um, and they experienced, or they, they reported that they felt more confident about their ability to build learning teams and working groups in the future. Uh, and I guess all of that is, is good, in that it certainly indicated that at least the collaborative effort, the effort that they felt their skills uh, in developing online collaboration had improved. <coughs> But just because the students feel they're better at something doesn't necessarily mean that they're quite better at it. And this is one of the things why this piece of work, even when I finished it, I was never entirely happy with it. One of the tools I used was a tool called Snap, which is now defunct. It doesn't work with any of the current versions of the current learning um, management systems. It was Social Networks Adapting Pedagogical Practice and it was designed in New Zealand and the idea with it was that it would take a social network a discussion board in a learning management system like Blackboard and it would give you a map of who was talking to whom. So you could see the level of activity and at the start um, in a group there would be very few posts and very few people responding to very few people and as the group went on the network map of interactions would become more dense. And you could identify from that, for example, which students were outliers and were only talking to one or two other people and which students were at the heart of the group. It's a classic social network analysis tool. Um, and at least it, it gave me a measure of activity. And I could run that map at the beginning and the middle and the end of the discussion tools and I could see that, okay, groups are, are looking interesting. There's a lot of stuff happening there. Um, and it seems like there's discussion going on, but, but that didn't necessarily, I felt, although I never measured the level of network activity against the final outcomes, um, but what it, it gave me was an external view of who was talking to whom, but it didn't tell me what people were saying. And, and that really was as far as I got in the master's <coughs> thesis. I was left with this question that I did not know what was being said. So for example, the network mapping tool did not allow me to distinguish meaningful interactions discussing knowledge with idle chat about last night's football match. You could have a very vigorous and exciting network map for a group, but they might be talking about something completely irrelevant. Or the content of the discussion might not necessarily be uh, very academically challenging. So I felt I was looking at the outside of the discussion, and I was seeing things moving around, but I wasn't seeing whether there was actual knowledge creation or understanding happening in the student's mind. And, and this moved me on, and since then I've been looking at this question and this problem that the tools we have, we have tools for managing discussion forums, but the actual keeping up with, if you have a class of 80 people, and you're assigning readings to them all, and they're all doing readings, and they're all posting discussions, and you're asking them to post once or twice a week, then suddenly you have, you know, uh, 200 forum posts in a week. So you can't actually necessarily read them all. Um, it's very hard to keep up with. It's more work than just sending them an essay at the end of the course and picking up the essay and grading it. Um, something is happening there in the discussion, and the question is, is there actually learning happening, and how do you find out early on whether key topics are being picked up in the discussion and, and moved around? Um, and so the question is, what exactly are the students learning? They're talking a lot, but what are they learning? Is the, is the discussion going around a group or is it simply two people in a group having a discussion? And in fact, this is a screen capture from Blackboard up here in the top um, right-hand corner. And it's from the same War State and Society class about two years ago, uh, where I, I started the course off and in the first week I sent a couple of readings about um, contemporary online learning. Um, 
as a starter to get them thinking about their own learning. And, and this is a discussion between me and the guy who was class rep. Uh, and who's now gone, and I think he's education officer for the Students' Union next year, so he was interested in online learning. So you have this discussion which produced a lot of posts, but it's just me and Kean talking over and back, and nobody else was getting involved in the discussion. So we had a great conversation, but the rest of the class were simply passive spectators. Um, and that's you know, a very clear example of how um, this was just an over and back tennis match, but we weren't bringing everybody else into the discussion with us. And how, how do you find ideas? Um, I have a capture there from a page, a diagram in a book. It's an entire book about writing literature reviews, but this is the one page I really love. Because it shows, it's about the development of, of work about DNA, and it shows the development of different strands of thought from about the 1820s up to the 1950s. And it shows the major articles and how they reference one another to map the development of knowledge in that field. And I looked at this and I thought, that's great. Because they're not just looking at who's referencing things, they're actually looking at what ideas in what articles are being picked up in other articles and developed and improved. So it's a map of the emerging consensus. And I said, why can't I do that in Blackboard, in my discussion forums? I want to be able to see my students' knowledge developing in the same way as that kind of knowledge map. And of course, you can't do it in Blackboard. Um, the tools don't allow you to do it. Um, so at the end of the day, I, I became conscious of this the quote from Ruth Lucklin, that um, there is a question that an awful lot of the activity that's going on in online learning may, in fact, be very superficial. The students may be ticking the boxes and posting twice a week because the rubric says you must post twice a week or you will lose marks. Um, but they're not actually, they're doing it in a rush, they're working, they don't have time, so they, they jump on the computer at five minutes to midnight because they have to post before midnight and they post in ten lines and therefore if you're counting and looking, did everybody post? Yes, everybody posted, but you're not seeing the content. So it got to the stage where, um, again the quote from Mick Healy, activity does, does not bring about learning. It needs to be integrated with critical thinking. So at the end, um, I, the stage of the process I got to was that blackboard shot from a real blackboard. I have a real blackboard in my office. They refurbished my office two years ago and I said, I want a blackboard. I want the blackboard you're throwing out. I want to put in my office. And the carpenter said, you couldn't put that in your office. We just painted the office. That's a dirty old blackboard. We should throw that in the skip. And I said, no, screw it to the wall in my office. And sure enough, I found a use for it. I printed out the discussion forums from, again, the same course, and blue tacked them to the blackboard and got post-it notes. The different colors of post-it notes relate to different concepts in the discussion. And then I photographed it and put it into a PDF and started drawing lines on it to see where issues of substance were being picked up in the discussion and how the students were following up on them. Um, and they were in roughly chronological order. And so one of these colors of post-its, I can't remember which, but a big issue in the history of warfare since the gunpowder revolution is the extent to how far does technology drive changes in warfare. The whole question of technological determinism, which is, is broadly interesting for the application of technology throughout history. So I wanted to see at what point in the discussion does a student pick up this phrase, because it was in the readings. So where does it appear in the postings? And who picks up that idea? And the idea may be expressed in different words. So who picks up that idea and develops it? In which post? How can I see that there's a discussion about actual ideas going on? And in order to do that, because our current learning management systems are so clunky, that the only way to do it was to print them out and stick them on the wall and draw lines on them to try and work out whether there was actually a discussion happening and what students, even though they were posting, were not actually making any useful contribution to the discussion, were not picking up any of the key concepts. I wanted to see, were people getting the critical, central ideas in the discussion? And I still have not found a tool that will allow me to do that in forum posts. So in Blackboard, I've looked at a number of them, you, can't, you can tag posts. But you can only tag the whole post, you have to collect all the posts, um, and then you have to select them, and then you have to tag them. So the only way you can tag an individual post is you have to go through three or four clicks before you can tag it and say, that relates to this particular piece of content. Moodle is different but equally bad. 
Um, there's no easy way that I can be looking at a student post and I can go, yes, highlight that. There they're talking about technological determinism. There's no way to map the semantics of the knowledge. Um, and if you have a post that has more than one idea, and a lot of the longer the better student posts will have several different ideas, then there is no learning management tool that will allow me when I'm reading that to highlight it and go, yes, that, that's there. I'm going to highlight that in green and tag it as technological determinism. I'm going to tag that as culture. I'm going to tag that as finance and follow that through the posts. There are tools that allow you to do it on the open web. There's a number of highlighting tools that allow you to highlight web pages. I like Digo, it's great. I can highlight stuff on a web page and I can attach a note to it, but it doesn't work inside Blackboard or any other current learning management system because they're stuck behind a, a login wall. So I have a problem, and the problem I have still is that I do not have a tool which will allow me quickly, if I have a large number of students, to semantically tag the things they're talking about um, and, and make that map of knowledge visible as it goes on. Um, and I don't know, I guess I'm going to have to get a research grant and hire some PhD students to write a discussion forum that does what I want. Um, so that, that's where it's at now. The question is still bothering me. Ten years on. That's brilliant. Mike, thank you so much. Um, it's really